So, warm welcome. And uh, today we have a special guest from UK, Sarah Eager. And uh, the topic is uh, nurturing my self-compassion. We are living difficult times, whether it's uh, stress from the work or uh, stress in the family, different kind of um, challenges we all have to face and it's good to ask ourselves how are we feeling so today we are going to look ourselves and uh, and definitely look into self-compassion and few words about Sarah Sarah Eager she's originally from Australia and uh, she's been a long time in London UK and uh, she is a retired consultant psychiatrist and a practitioner, practitioner of Raja Yoga meditation for over 40 years and a certified mindful self-compassion teacher. So definitely we are together with uh, someone who is very experienced in this field of feeling, emotions and uh, our mental health. But also, I know Sarah is a lady with a big heart, and her advices are always very, how could I say, you feel easy with Sarah, and you feel like someone is really understanding you. So I'm very happy to welcome you, and welcome to Finland virtually. Hello, Sarah. Warm welcome. And I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Gita, and um, thank you, everyone, for inviting me. Um, I think I wanted to start by really just saying that uh, as a doctor, a healthcare practitioner, I've had to, I've been on my own spiritual journey, and learning to be kind to myself has been really quite an important aspect of that. So it's a very deep thing, I think, about how as we go along on a spiritual path that we can be quite hard on ourselves often and, and, and even at work we can somehow feel we're not good enough or we're not somehow doing our best. And so it's been a really important thing for me to learn as someone who's meditating and um, you know, sometimes driven by this feeling that, that you're not good enough or you're not lovable or somehow there, there's, or you're trying to please other people. <laughs> there are lots of uh, things that can be underneath uh, our behavior. And so for me personally, this, this skill, if you like, or this practice of giving kindness to myself has been really, really um, part of a healing journey and and something that once you kind of get it once you understand the dynamics of it it makes you stronger and more independent and really uh, and, and opens your heart so there's a lot of very deep aspects to this journey of self-kindness and I love the quote on the uh, poster you know, and I think it's you know know yourself you know somehow when you know yourself you will be kinder to yourself and so there's a very deep spiritual truth to this as well about knowing myself what I am who I am and when I really realize that what I am is spiritual energy and that the core essence of that spiritual energy is love, I realise that, that I am love. I have love within me. Um, it's part of my, my core identity, my original qualities. And so that is available to me um, as much as anything else. And that sense of self-sufficiency comes in. So I think it's very deeply connected to a spiritual journey. And what I'd like to do 
for you in the next half an hour is I'm going to use some slides, but just take you a little bit through the the science and the psychology of self-compassion, understanding what it's about. And then after the question and answer, we'll just do a little meditation exercise to give you a, a flavor of it. So I hope that's okay. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. So I hope you can see that. Maybe Gita nod. <laughs> Is that visible? Good. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, just before I start, I was just, I always like you to think a little bit about what does self-compassion or what does compassion mean? Not even thinking about self, but just the word compassion. What does that mean to you? And this isn't uh, a thing of a, a right or wrong answer. It's not an exam, but just to spend a minute for you to think what, when I say the word compassion, what comes up for you? What does that look like or feel like for you? And literally the translation of compassion is to suffer with. But we don't often think of suffering with others as compassion. It's deeper than that. Maybe that's empathy when I'm feeling a little bit of what others are feeling. But compassion's even more complex than that. But it is essentially about our relationship to suffering, to pain, to uh, sorrow, to things that aren't going well. So how do we respond to those situations? How do we relate to them? And these are some nice quotes. So the Dalai Lama feels that compassion is the wish that all sentient or living beings may be free from suffering. And another person who's a psychologist in the UK, Paul Gilbert, he talks about the uh, deep awareness of the suffering of oneself and others, other living beings, so that might be animals or plants or anything, coupled with the wish and effort to alleviate it. And there's always this sort of paradox, in a sense, with suffering and compassion, because suffering in some ways is inevitable. We all suffer in, in our lives. It's something to do with the human condition at the moment, and why do we suffer? And yet we want to alleviate suffering. We want it to, um, we want people to be free from suffering. So there is this inherent paradox that we know it's part of life, but at the same time, we want to help relieve it. So um, very nice saying from Myanmar, when the sunshine of loving kindness meets the tears of suffering, the rainbow of compassion arises. So as I was mentioning in the beginning, this, this nature of myself, this nature of love, this, this loving kindness that's right at the core of me, when it meets that, that scene or that situation of suffering or pain outside, that's when this feeling of compassion arises. And, you know, compassion is kind of like an energy. You know, when you think about the words in the dictionary that go with compassion, it's like loving kindness, empathy, warmth, tenderness, mercy, fellow feeling, kind heartedness, charity, benevolence. So all these words give you, invoke a sense of what's this energy of compassion. So it's, it's, it really is almost like a power that we have, a power that we have, that we can give this energy of kindness to others, but we also can give it to ourselves. That is the key point. And another thing to understand about compassion, this is a very nice breakdown of when you're being compassionate you're actually doing quite a few things at once 
So one thing you're doing is the first thing you're doing in a way is you're noticing. And so you're paying attention. And if it's in someone else, you're paying attention and noticing what's going on with them. But you could equally notice what's going on with you. And, and this noticing thing is really at that first step of all meditation practices, isn't it? We start, we relax, we take a deep breath. And we just notice what's going on inside of me. How am I feeling? What am I thinking about? Before we start maybe even focusing our attention. So just this noticing is the first step of any spiritual practice. Understanding. So if we're going to act in the right way, we kind of need to know what's going on. So what might be the cause of the suffering? What are the components that have led to this situation? So this, this idea of, of understanding involves some kind of knowledge, some kind of wisdom, some kind of analysis or interpretation. So seeing what's going on so that I'm going to, to be able to do the right thing. And then this, this, this aspect of empathising, so empathy and compassion actually use different parts of the brain. They've done some studies on this. And empathy is like the mirror neuron. So we can pick up really literally what other people are feeling. And it's good to do that, but not too much. So if we really felt exactly what other people were feeling all the time, we'd just be a mess. So this skill of empathy is we can just touch it and you think, oh, I see you're feeling sad or oh, I can tell you're, you're feeling happy or, you know, you're feeling upset. So it's you just touch on empathy. And I think it's something the Dalai Lama was asked, you know, how much empathy should you have? And, and he said just a little. So it's just enough to know what others are feeling. But you want to move into compassion quite quickly because compassion is the energy that's going to lift us out of that suffering and that's the helping taking thoughtful and appropriate action and it's action but sometimes as we all know it's the thoughtful and appropriate thing to do is maybe just listen maybe just be present maybe just be silent it's not action always in the sense of having to do something so that's also quite deep. So this idea that really compassion involves courage and wisdom. Very deep. And what I'd like you to just do for a minute, just for a very uh, short uh, space of time, and this could be a longer exercise if we were doing a workshop, but just for a minute, imagine you're with a friend who's suffering, who's had a bad time or something's gone wrong. And just remind yourself when your friends or loved ones are in this situation, how do you respond to them? Normally, what's your language or your, your actions? You know, do you give them a hug or hold their hand or what's your body language? When you notice someone else is suffering, what's your normal response to that? Or just think of a time when you had someone around you who had lost someone or something bad had happened to them or they were unwell. In particular, recall your tone of voice, the kind of words you use, and also your body language and how you were feeling. And now I'd like you to just put that aside and now remember a time when you were suffering in some way. So you made a mistake or had a misfortune or failed. You were ill. How did you respond to yourself? <clears throat> what was your tone of voice? What kind of words did you use? What was your body language? How did you feel? Just 
Just take time to rem recall that some time recently when you were suffering in some way. How did you respond to yourself? And what you will notice probably, because they've done research on this, and about 80% of people say what they notice with this very simple exercise is that they are kinder to others than they are to themselves. So if you notice that, when you compare those two situations, it's really very normal. It's a very common reaction. So we're kinder to others than ourselves. About 18% of people say they're about the same and about 2% of people say they're kinder to themselves than others. But that's not a common response. So we're kinder to others than ourselves for lots and lots of reasons. Um, again, if we, we had time to have a discussion, you know, sometimes we feel that we're not worthy uh, sometimes we have voices or experiences from the past which are telling us we're no good. We don't want to seem like we're arrogant or we're egotistical, so we put ourselves down. Um, our cultural conditioning may have made us feel like we're not as worthy of kindness of other, as other people. Lots and lots of reasons why this might be the case. But it's very, very common. But it's really important to notice and to, to understand that when I'm not kind to myself, that that is having an effect. That is affecting my body, my physiology, my thoughts, my feelings. When I'm unkind to myself, it's like I'm threatening myself. And that is going to have a direct effect on my health. So... Why is it important that we learn how to be kinder to ourselves, that we actually practice it actively being kind to ourselves? This is a very nice point, the Dalai Lama. Again, um, for someone to develop genuine compassion for others, first they must have a basis upon which to cultivate compassion. And that basis is the ability to connect with your own feelings and to care for your own welfare. Caring for others requires caring for oneself. And again, it's a very deep subject because it might be, you know, it's like that saying, put on your own oxygen mask first, or, you know, how if you're, you need to be strong in order to, to help others. But somehow we're not so good at caring for ourselves. And it's worth exploring why that is. So someone who's done a lot of research and, and created a, a very nice course, the Mindful Self-Compassion course, is Kristen Neff. She's a psychologist in America. And um, her definition of self-compassion is very simple. It's basically treating yourself as the same way as you would a good friend. So if a good friend is having a rough time, if a good friend is going through a difficult situation, you're there for them, you're supporting them, you're being kind, you're having gentle words, you're, you're giving them a hug or, you know, you're, you've got their back. So just think about that. I'm sure you're all very good at being good friends to other people. And so this is really actively becoming a good friend for yourself. So that's what we're going to just unpack a bit now. She says there are three components to self-compassion. So this first one, which we call mindfulness or self-awareness, balanced awareness, meditation, it's like that first uh, step in, in compassion. It's noticing. So mindfulness is that, that ability to notice what is going on in my body, in my thoughts, in my feelings. Where am I at? Checking in with myself. And the more quiet I can be, the stiller I can be, the more present and in the moment I can be, I'm going to connect with myself much more deeply and strongly. So this mindfulness is, is the first step. Nice little saying, you've got to feel it so you can heal it. 
common humanity. So this, when we're suffering, we often feel like we're alone, we're uniquely uh, being targeted by the universe to make our lives unpleasant, but actually everyone suffers at some point or other in their life. It's a very normal human experience. So I'm not alone when I'm suffering. It actually connects us. It makes us aware of each other's vulnerabilities and each other as human beings. And then this step of self-kindness. So when I notice I'm suffering, when I realise I'm not alone, we all suffer, can I give myself the kindness that I would normally be able to give to someone else? And you might say, well, how do I give myself kindness? And there are lots of ways you can do that. You can do that with touch, with soothing touch, with the tone of voice that you use when you speak to yourself, with the kind of self-care activities that you carry out, with, with the, the kind of words that you use. So many things are giving yourself kindness. So you can look at those. And this is in contrast to how we often respond now. You know, we're not so good at this, this self-kindness business. So instead of mindfulness, instead of that sense of just a little bit of spaciousness between me and my thoughts, that I'm the observer of my thoughts, that I'm generating these thoughts, but they're not me. These thoughts and feelings are like the materials of an artist, of a painter. They're creating a picture on the canvas, but they know they're not the paint. They know they're, they're just creating it. So often what we do is we over-identify with our thoughts and feelings. Thoughts and feelings come and they go, but sometimes they just feel overwhelming. Um, and so we're trying to bring ourselves back into balance by keeping that sense of mindfulness. Common humanity versus isolation, I've mentioned. And this self-kindness versus self-judgment. As I said earlier, when we're judging ourselves, and this is often what we do when something bad's gone wrong, we sort of say, oh, you stupid thing, or how could you have done that, or you idiot, you know, the kind of things we say to ourselves we wouldn't say to anyone else unless we're having a fight with our husband or something. But it really, the language we use is triggering that part of the brain which responds to threat. I'm just going to talk about that in a little more detail because it's important to understand. So when we're responding to threat, we are triggering this uh, fear system. This is the red circle. And this system is where the emotions of anger and anxiety, disgust and fear arise. And it's a very important system to keep us out of danger. You know, if we're going to be run over by a bus and we have to jump back from the curb or something, we have to act very quickly. It's important. But everyday stresses in our lives are really triggering this system a lot. So we're kind of living in a threat-based environment which creates adrenaline and the stress hormones. And it's also triggered when we... Uh, critical of ourselves so we can stress ourselves out by the way we talk to ourselves and that's a really important thing to understand the dopamine system is the doing system so the doing system is you know we're busy busy long to do lists very active um, and it's also associated with addictive behavior gambling checking our messages on our phones we we get a little bit of a pleasure from the dopamine, <clears throat> but it's very addictive. And then what we're trying to move more into is this contented, safe and connected space. So this is a space where we are using more um, the oxytocin, the hormone of mother and baby bonding, the love hormone, um, endorphins, feel good. And that's when we, we're kind of in the flow, we're feeling yeah. very kind of chilled and, and, and things are going well for us. And if you think about how your life is most of the time, you know, and you can just, how much time am I f 
spending feeling just a bit stressed, just a bit on edge, quite anxious, a little bit anxious? How much time am I busy, busy, busy doing lots of things? How much time am I really just in my flow, in my good rhythm of things? And often it's um, it looks a bit more like this that we're out of balance. And when we're out of balance, we're finding, we find it harder to really have that compassionate response to others and to ourselves. So all the, the practices of meditation, of learning how to be kind to ourselves, we're trying to bring ourselves back into balance. And so we're trying to really change from this threat response to this care response. And I'm sure you've heard of these flight, fight, and freeze uh, responses. And when we turn them inwards, that fight response turns to self-criticism. The flight response turns to isolation, loneliness, feeling abandoned. And the freeze one turns to thoughts going round and round in our minds. And we want to give the antidote to these kind of threat responses by caring for ourselves with self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness or meditation. Sometimes people say, oh, you know, isn't being kind to yourself a bit wishy-washy? Doesn't it mean that you're being self-indulgent and you're letting yourself, you know, sit in front of the telly and eat popcorn all day? No, it's not like that because self-compassion wants what's really best for you. And there are the yin or the softer aspects of self-compassion, comforting, soothing, validating, being with ourselves. But there's also the active part of self-compassion, sometimes called fierce compassion, where we're protecting ourselves, we're providing, we're motivating, you know, and that would include discipline. So self-compassion is the thing that helps us become more disciplined and motivated because we're doing it for the sake of ourselves, to be kind, to be good to ourselves. And also a very deep thing to understand about self-compassion, as I said earlier on, it is truly reflecting our true nature. So our true nature, our spiritual nature, is one of love, is one of peace, and I'm sure you're all aware of that. And those soul qualities are interacting via our thoughts and our feelings with our body and triggering those physiological responses. So we can have a stress response in our body depending on really what kind of thoughts I'm generating, or we can have a calm and kind and soothing response according, again, to the kind of thoughts we're generating and the way we're responding. Um, but this is a reflection of our true nature, our true nature of, of love, our true nature of peace, our true nature of joy and power. So when you're meditating, when you're connecting to yourself and to a universal source, you're really refreshing and reminding yourself of those original qualities. So when we talk about, so how can we trigger these things? And some of the most common ways of triggering self-compassion is, as I said, this soothing touch thing, because soothing touch, I'm sure when you're remembering your friend who was suffering, many of you will have given your friend a hug or put your hand on their shoulder or just held their hand. And you can actually do that for yourself. And you probably do have little habits where you're soothing yourself um, already, where you're just holding your own hand. But you can do that consciously, putting your hand on your heart. May I be kind to myself and really feel that energy of kindness. That will trigger that compassionate response. Speaking to yourself in a kind way, really seeing the best in yourself, not that harsh inner critic that sometimes can dominate. And physical warmth, you know, many times if someone's suffering, we want to give them a hot drink, a cup of tea, a hot water bottle, hot bath. Apparently having a hot bath makes you feel less lonely. <laughs> it's very interesting. So I read that recently in a paper. 
and just a smile. So, you know, the expression on our face, how much can we give other people just by making eye contact, really smiling and, and giving love through the eyes. And you can also do that for yourself. Sometimes we call it an inner smile. So what I'd like to do later, and we're going to stop for questions in a minute, but it's just take you, I'm going to take you at the end through a little exercise where we're going to practice this. So you get a sense of what giving yourself very actively and consciously giving yourself kindness feels like. But just before we go into the question and answer, um, I just wanted to also share with you a couple of resources. And one is this book, which um, I wrote with someone called Jan Aoko when we were in lockdown. And it's very, very practical. It's um, got seven tools which include loving myself, but also creating inner safety, being present, stepping back and accepting, empowering, connecting, discovering inner peace and wholeness. So you'll find there's a whole kind of um, method there for going deeper into your own inner stillness, your own strengths. Um, it's a very practical book and it's got some audio tracks which you can download as well and listen to from the Janky Foundation website. So some meditation tracks. It's available as an ebook and also as a paperback. So I'd really recommend if you feel you're struggling at all or you'd like some help with these techniques, you'll find that this is a good starting place. And also through the Janky Foundation, which is a charity that helps healthcare professionals. We created this free uh, app called Happy Dote. So there are stressful situations and then just little three minute meditations that will give you the antidote to that situation and some core meditations. Because we felt that you really needed something short and quick that you could do at the time, it's much better to try and apply the antidote as quickly as possible. And don't let it go round and round in your head and, and kind of create more waves and disturbance. So do check out this app because uh, it was made really just to help people cope with stressful situations in daily life. So I think I haven't done too badly. <laughs> We've got time now for some questions if uh, Gita would like to, to do share those. Thank you, Sarah. Such a wonderful presentation and uh, important topic as well. And uh, what I learned today really is uh, you gave this example very clearly. How do we treat our friends when they are going through rough times? And how do we treat ourselves? And I could experience definitely a big big difference in that and um, it is interesting that how we are so hard to ourselves. I could experience more like a demand demanding attitude if I'm feeling sad or not not very good it's like go on you know get it over <laughs> so does it mean also that we are demanding for others if we are demanding for ourselves, are we eventually also quite demanding for others as well? Yeah, I think quite possibly. Um, maybe not as overtly, but I guess because a lot of the way we talk to ourselves has been conditioned by the way we were spoken to as children um, or our culture speaks to us or relation people in significant relationships have spoken to us so we've internalized that and so it becomes um it be can become a habit that it's very it's, it's it's how we it's the lens through which we see the world and so if i'm saying to myself come on you can do that it is quite possible that i will say to others as well come on you can do that you know <laughs> so i think that's why the dalai lama was saying really if you can have compassion for yourself, you know, in a sense, if you can learn to, to really cultivate that sense of deep kindness and, and love for yourself, 
that it, it, it will also have the same effect, that it, it opens your heart to mm-hmm. others as well. And, and, and so I think, you know, there's a lot in the press these days, isn't there, because people are seeing the world is in quite a bad state. And so there's a call for compassion. People are saying we need more compassion in the world. But I think the key is if you haven't learned how to give compassion to yourself, really in a, in a real significant, honest way, the compassion, what you might end up doing, what you might think is compassion could be rescuing, could be, you know, it could be you're helping others just to make yourself feel better. It's, it's, it's a very deep subject, I think. Really, what does it mean to really love myself? Yeah. Always. That's true. Thank you, Sarah. And also for others, if you have any questions, feel free to write in the chat. And um, yes, um, mm, but we all also have uh, some friends we turn. We will make a phone call if we have a bad time. There is always some person we know that this person is always nice to me. So, so maybe something to learn from those people who are non-judgmental and, and because at that time we really like to be next to those people who doesn't criticize us and we can feel good it's interesting sometimes yeah yeah yeah, sometimes as part of that exercise of these exercises we can we say you know we're uh, and we'll do this in a minute but you you think of a situation when you're suffering and we might and you're practicing giving yourself kindness and sometimes people do struggle to find nice words to say to each other, to themselves. And so we say, imagine if a dear friend of yours was going through the same situation, what would you say to them? Mm-hmm. And that often helps people just get into that, the, that um, frame of mind. If it's not about themselves, if it's about someone else, then they can think of the nice and kind words to say. So that's a little trick that you can, can do. But equally, as you say, what are the qualities or the uh, attributes of someone that you would go to if you were suffering? Why is it you go to that person? What is it about them mm. or about your relationship that is, that is supportive, that's, that you find comforting? Mm. And, and I think that's also why in, in meditation, A lot of us feel that in meditation when we connect to ourselves but also when we connect to something uh, like universal love or a higher power, that the quality of that relationship is one where I feel understood, I feel accepted, uh, I feel comforted and loved. And I think it's why, that's why that relationship for a lot of people is very healing when they feel those qualities. Mm, wonderful. Uh, here is one question, and it's about more like if you really feel like lonely and uh, feel like you don't even have friends, if you're really like maybe feeling so isolated, is, uh, what is, is there any tips for that kind of uh, situation? Well, um, I I could start by recommending something we did last year at the Janky Foundation, which is on our website, which is a whole series of workshops or, or seminars we did called Embracing Isolation. And it was looking at this topic in a lot of depth about when we feel lonely, what are some of the things we can do? And, you know, there were lots of speakers who shared many, many um, good ideas. And all those talks are on the Janky Foundation website. So embracing isolation. But I think there are people who who just enjoy their own company, I guess, and, and don't feel lonely. And there are also people who we'll make friends with anybody. They'll be out in the park or in a shop and 
they'll just talk to people or um, make that connection. But it's been very hard in lockdown, hasn't it, with COVID and everything. So people have really been struggling with that feeling of being alone. But again, I would say that practice of meditation where you feel connected to a higher energy, that's available to everyone. And so when you have that connection, actually, you don't feel alone. Even when you are alone, you have a feeling of that someone's with you, someone's caring for you. It's very um, soothing and comforting. But again, another thing they say is, you know, one of the best ways of helping yourself is to help other people and, you know, going out and volunteering or just doing something for someone else. You can start off feeling, oh, I don't have the energy, I don't want to do it, but you get something back. It's it's kind of like um, a win-win situation because in helping other people, you also gain something. So... Those are just a few things off the top of my head. <laughs> Very nice. Yes, uh, we have heard this, that if you think you are lacking something, start giving it. Yeah. So um, uh, if you think that people are not friendly to you, start giving friendliness to others. Or It's a very interesting way of breaking the spell of something circulating in our mind. Oh, this is so wrong. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. But uh, Sarah, we're really looking forward for this uh, exercise and we don't want to make it too short. So maybe we start with that. Okay. We are all in the need of a little bit of self-compassion. <laughs> Good. So this is called a self-compassion break. Okay. So I'm just going to talk you through this and... Um, give you hopefully a little experience of what that feels like really actively energetically giving kindness to myself okay so i'm just going to speak it like a visualization but i'd also to start with a little meditation so you tune into yourself So let's just start by taking a few deep breaths. Just listening to that bell ring out and quietly go into silence. First of all, let me just tune into my body. Allow my shoulders to drop. My arms and legs to relax. Just connect with the rhythm of my breathing, of just breathing in and breathing out. As I breathe in, breathe in peace. And as I breathe out, just to breathe out any tension, just really let go. Now I'd like you to bring to mind a situation in your life right now that might be causing you a little bit of stress. So it might be a work problem or a relationship problem, maybe a health problem, or even a friend who's struggling. So just bring to mind something that you're 
finding a little challenging right now, maybe not a 10 out of 10 because you're just practicing self-kindness, but enough of a situation when you think about it, you can feel the tension a little bit in your body. Just see how your body reacts. Just allow yourself to see and hear and feel your way into the problem. Just notice where in your body do you feel it? Is it like a tightness in your chest or a knot in your stomach or a tension in your shoulders? make contact with this discomfort in your body. And then saying to yourself slowly and kindly, this is a moment of suffering. And you may have your own words for this. I don't feel very comfortable or I feel stressed, I feel anxious, this hurts. Whatever words come to mind for you, but just acknowledging, noticing how you're feeling acknowledging and validating the fact that this is a moment of suffering. I feel stressed. So you're not trying to change it, not justifying or resisting it, you're just accepting. This is a moment of suffering. And suffering is part of life. We all go through moments of life, go through moments like this. Moments of suffering come and they go. And I'm not alone because others also struggle with these feelings. Others are just like me. And this is our common humanity. We can all feel the pain and the struggle of suffering. And as a response to that suffering, I invite you to put your hand on your heart or any other place that feels soothing for you, holding your own hand, giving yourself a little hug, putting your hands on your belly. Put your hand on your heart is a very nice one. And just saying to yourself, because I am suffering, May I be kind to myself. And just allow the energy and warmth of compassion to flow through your hand and into your heart. And saying to yourself, words of self-kindness, may I be friendly towards myself. 
May I accept myself as I am. May I give myself what I need. May I be in love. And as we mentioned, if you're struggling to find the right words, maybe imagine a dear friend was going through the same thing as you. What might you say to them? Can you offer that same message to yourself? And as you go deeper into your own spiritual nature of love, just feel that energy of love that you are, tending to that part of you which is in pain, sending good wishes and healing energy. to that situation, to your body, to your mind. And you may even feel the help and companionship of another energy, a higher source that is also sending you love and peace. And you feel that presence as a good friend who understands and loves you. And so taking in all that love and kindness from a universal source, from your own spiritual nature. Just feel that healing energy. And taking a few deep breaths, gradually bring yourself back into the present moment and open your eyes.